Fair Review, Print Speaking to the Blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. From the Herald... Wednesday the 21st of February, from a sports section. Football. Lockyer recalls how his heart stopped for 2 minutes and 40 seconds. This article is unattributed. Luton captain Tom Lockyer said he literally died after his heart stopped for 2 minutes and 40 seconds during his harrowing on-pitch cardiac arrest. The 29-year-old Welshman, speaking at length, for the first time since he collapsed in the 59th minute of the Hatters' abandoned Premier League game against Bournemouth on December the 16th, admitted that it is out of his hands if he will ever play again. Lockyer was fitted with an implantable cardioverter defibrillator after he was hospitalised for five days. Reliving the incident which rocked the football world, Lockyer, who also suffered a collapse during May's Championship playoff victory against Coventry, told Sky Sports, it was just a normal day and that was the most worrying thing because I felt completely fine. I have been looking for answers since but I have not been able to find any because it was just another day at the office. I was running towards a halfway line and I went really light-headed. I thought it'd be okay in a second, but I wasn't. I woke up and the paramedics were there. I knew instantly it was different to my collapse in May. Last time it felt like I woke up from a dream and this time I woke up from nothingness. I could see there was more panic and I was a bit disorientated. I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I was trying to work out what was happening and I remember thinking, I could be dying here. It was a surreal thought to have, not being able to respond, and you can see the panic going on. Lockyer's voice crackled as he continued. I could feel them put a drip in my arm and it was a hard mix of emotions. Eventually I came round and I was able to speak and to respond. When I felt okay, it was in a relief I was alive. Following what happened in May, I have a recording device in my chest and I was out for 2 minutes and 40 seconds. It was the hardest in my family having to watch that. They had it worse than me. My old man was there at the match and my girlfriend was 7 months pregnant at the time. My mum was at home listening to it on the radio. She went off to make a cup of tea after Bournemouth scored and when she came back my brother had turned the radio off. She asked why, and he had to say to her that Tom has gone down off the ball again. This is the bigger picture that people don't see, and that is the hardest part to deal with. I'm not going to lie, it's been a tough couple of months. I don't know if I have processed what happened. I don't know if it would come back and bite me in the bum, but I have not had any emotions since what what happened. I literally died, but I have been numb to the whole thing since. Lockyer had an emotional reunion with his teammates at the club's training ground last month. His first visit to the Hatters has been since, since the collapse. The defender hopes he will be able to return to top flight football, but said he will be subjected to further tests before he has an answer. Lockyer, speaking ahead of his side's clash with Manchester United, continued, It is out of my hands if he plays again. I'm going to be dictated by the medical staff and the specialists. If there is a chance I could play again, and I am not going to do anything against medical advice, then I would love to. But it's far too early to say. There are tests that have to happen in the background, but I wouldn't write it off yet. If I am not allowed to play again, then I can say I have Captain Luton in the Premier League and I have scored a Premier League goal. I am very fortunate that I have high moments in my career and scoring a Premier League goal is something you dream of as a kid. I am incredibly grateful to be alive. I have the device fitted now and I feel almost invincible. In the article was unattributed. 
This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 22nd of February 2024 from the news section. Bid for Glasgow Charles Rennie Mackintosh mural in area he grew up in. This exclusive article is written by Craig Williams. As Scotland's most celebrated architect and designer of the 20th century, Charles Rennie Mackintosh's work is recognised throughout the world. In his native Glasgow, he left a remarkable and world-class design legacy, with his wonderful architectural style visible in buildings such as Queen's Cross Church, House for an Art Lover and Scotland Street School Museum. In honour and celebration of the man and his work, a bronze statue, unveiled on the 90th anniversary of his death, stands in the Anderston district of the city, while a giant mural adorns the wall above the Clutha Bar next to the River Clyde. Now, the City Heritage Group has called for a new Charles Rennie Mackintosh mural to be created in the area of Glasgow he once called home. The architect and designer lived in a tenement on Fir Park Terrace in Deniston, behind Tenants Well Park Brewery, from 1875 until 1892, the year he met Margaret MacDonald, while they were both students at the Glasgow School of Art. Deniston's style, which showcases the history, social history, heritage and style of Deniston and the east end of Glasgow, has proposed that the gable end of a listed building on Duke Street, around 500 metres from Mackintosh's former home, be the location of a new permanent mural celebrating his legacy. The group also suggested that the mural could be based on James Craig Annan's famous portrait of Mackintosh as a young man. They told the Herald, Charles Rennie Mackintosh was born in Townhead in 1868, and his family, moving up the social ladder, moved to the leafy suburb of Deniston to Fir Park Terrace in 1875 and lived there until 1892. Given Mackintosh's connection to Deniston, it's only fitting this genius is commemorated where he was brought up. It would also be an amazing addition to the Glasgow Mural Trail to bring people to Deniston. The call comes amid a long-running saga involving the gable end on Duke Street, which has sparked fresh fears that businesses are continuing to exploit a loophole to create huge mural adverts without receiving prior permission from Glasgow City Council. In October 2022, a mural on the gable end of the listed tenement, which was built in the 1850s, was commissioned by shoe retailer Clarks to advertise their desert boots as part of their new For the World Ahead brand campaign, before another commercial mural for banking brand, the current account switch service, appeared on the same gable end earlier this month. Both murals were painted over within four weeks of appearing on the gable end, leading to concerns that businesses were commissioning temporary murals to effectively exploit the 28-day rule for using land or buildings for an alternative use, contained within planning regulations for the temporary use of land in the Town and Country Planning, General Permitted Development Scotland Order. The provision is often used by event organisations for events such as local fairs, and effectively allows for a site to be used without formal planning permission. Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven, previously suggested that a permanent mural be commissioned for the gable end to stop it being used by commercial enterprises for advertising. He told the Herald, We all want to see high-quality street art brightening up the city, but commercial businesses should not be able to use loopholes to bypass regulations and avoid engagement with the local community. I would support a community-led project to deliver a permanent mural on this highly visible site on Duke Street. Councillor Alan Casey, who represents the Deniston Ward, echoed the MSP's calls, adding, 
While it is nice to see this gable end brighten up an important gateway into Deniston, it is disappointing that yet again another commercial organisation is exploiting a loophole to avoid planning and advertising consent and not involving the local community. Glasgow has a vibrant and diverse range of murals across the city, which help create splashes of colour which brighten up our lanes and streets. To avoid this commercial exploitation happening in this location again, it is my hope that there will be a proper community-led project to investigate if there can be a longer-term community mural which would bring some much-needed public street art into Deniston and could have the potential to link up with Glasgow's successful city centre mural trail. That exclusive article was written by Craig Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 22nd of February 2024 from the news section. LGML harmed patients confront Neil Gray outside Holyrood. This article is written by Katrina Stewart. Campaigners seeking a public inquiry into the actions of a disgraced surgeon held a mock funeral procession outside the Scottish Parliament. In an increasingly heated exchange, new Health Secretary Neil Gray was told progress in appointing an inquiry chairperson has been too slow and more patients harmed by Professor Sam El Jamel will die waiting for answers. Dozens of former patients and their family members held a vigil in Edinburgh on Wednesday afternoon, sitting behind a coffin and with a banner reading, You dither, we die. Mr Gray is the fifth health secretary to be appointed in the time the harmed patients campaign group, led by El Jamel victim Jules Rose, has been calling for an official probe into how the surgeon was allowed to continue to work for NHS Tayside despite a litany of medical errors. Ms Rose said, The government is dithering and meanwhile time is running out. We are going to be dying by the time they appoint a chair. The patients are understandably angry. They're frustrated and in chronic pain. We want to get this action moving. As for Mr Gray, appointed following Michael Matheson's resignation over an £11,000 iPad bill, spoke to protesters. Karen Ogg, a former nurse, scoffed at his insistence progress is being made. Ms Ogg, who has given a botched spine operation, said, You hope you're making progress, or you are making progress. Hope isn't damn good enough any more. Her remarks came after Mr Gray told those gathered he hopes a chairperson will be in place in very short order. Speaking to journalists after the protest, Mr Gray said, I wanted to offer my support to the victims of Sam El Jamel to let them know that we are making progress on the establishment of a public inquiry as soon as possible. I am hopeful that we can make a positive announcement in terms of the appointment of a chair in due course, and I understand the need for answers in these cases because, as we are hearing so powerfully, People's lives have been ruined, and we've lost lives in the interim, and people deserve to have answers. Professor El Jamel worked at NHS Tayside from 1995 until he was suspended in 2013, and the Patients Action Group for El Jamel Public Inquiry estimates 172 people are known to have been harmed by him. A public inquiry was announced by First Minister Humza Yousaf in September, but lead campaigner Jules Rose, who was Professor El Jamel's final victim, said 166 days was too long to wait for any further timeline. Ms Rose was diagnosed with a brain tumour, but El Jamel removed a healthy tear gland instead of the tumour. Protesters carried a coffin to symbolise the victims of Professor El Jamel who will not live to see the completion of the inquiry or subsequent recommendations. Julianne Hall from Kirkcaldy had to give up her career as a hairdresser after being operated on by El Jamel in October 2009 in Dundee's Nine Wells Hospital. 
Ms. Hall has stenosis of the spine and had been booked in for the insertion of an interspinous traction device. But the surgeon, against her wishes, changed the operation the night before to a laminectomy. She said, I didn't want to go ahead with this procedure, but I felt I had to. When she came round from the operation, Ms. Hall discovered she had suffered a leak of spinal fluid because her spinal column had been punctured and nerves to her legs and feet had been severed. Prior to the surgery, she had been planning to start her own hairdressing business, but instead had to give up her work. She was bedbound for a month, and initially, she said, El Jamel refused to carry out corrective surgery, but eventually operated again, although there was no improvement to her condition. Ms Hall said, He just kept saying, You look OK, which seemed a bit strange. Since then I've suffered a lot of pain and no feeling in my legs and feet, which is so strange. She found out about the other patients around three years ago. Miss Hall added, I knew nothing about this. I was led to believe I was the only one. The health board had never even acknowledged there was an error. I have been told they cannot operate again due to the severity of the spine's condition. So I just need to get on with it. I've been left to just get on with it. I was given a few physio exercises and sent home. While well, she says there has been joy in coming to know the other campaigners and having their support, the impact of finding out about the dozens of other victims has been heart-wrenching. She said, Jules is amazing. I don't know where she gets her strength from. She is unbeatable. She is always there for all of us. All of us, and there's a lot of us. I feel nothing towards El Jamel. I am just so mad. I am so annoyed and so angry. I am so mad not to see him and for him not to be involved in any of this. He was just never to be seen again. The public inquiry will make a huge, huge difference just to get everyone heard. There's a lot still to come out. We've just scraped the tip of the iceberg. Professor El Jamel is now believed to be operating in Libya with ministers previously hinting the disgraced surgeon could eventually be extradited back to Scotland. Scottish Tory leader Douglas Ross said it was a disgrace that victims had to gather outside Holyrood for the fifth time. He said, Five months on, another new health secretary, and there is still no date for the public inquiry to begin. People need answers. They have been so badly treated first of all by El Jamel and then by NHS Tayside. I think it's hugely regretful and deeply disappointing that they've had to come back to Parliament to get what they were promised. That article was written by Katrina Stewart. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 22nd of February 2024 from the news section. Harris Tweed Hebrides Chairman Honoured for work to revive industry. This article is written by Craig Williams. The chairman of Harris Tweed Hebrides has been honoured with the prestigious Textiles Award. Ian A. Mackenzie was presented with a silver medal at the prestigious Worshipful Company of Weavers Textile Awards in recognition of his contribution to the textile industry specifically for his work to revitalise the Harris Tweed industry. The award was presented by the Right Honourable Lord Mayor Alderman Michael Manelli at an event at the Sadler's Hall in London on Tuesday. Mr Mackenzie has worked in the Harris Tweed industry for 50 years, starting as a home weaver, then as the Chief Executive of the Harris Tweed Authority, prior to the formation of the Harris Tweed Hebrides, when he became the company's first chief executive, followed by his current role as chairman. Harris Tweed Hebrides was founded in 2007 by Ian Mackenzie, Ian Taylor and Brian Wilson, following a period of significant decline within the Harris Tweed industry. Together with a team of skilled island-based textile professionals, Ian reopened the derelict mill in the village of Shawbost on the west side of Lewis 
and built a global business which employs over 70 islanders while providing home weaving to over 100 self-employed Harris Tweed weavers who live and work across the island of Lewis and Harris. The company is widely credited with the revitalisation of the Harris Tweed industry, which remains a vital component of the local economy of the Outer Hebrides. Acknowledging this prestigious award, Mr Mackenzie said, I'm delighted to accept this award on behalf of our island industry and all those who have worked with me over these past 50 years. The Worshipful Company of Weaver's Silver Medal is awarded in recognition of an individual's contribution to the UK weaving industry in the field of technology, management, education or the craft of weaving. That article was written by Craig Williams. These letters are from The Herald on Thursday the 22nd of February 2024. They are in the Voices section and the headline of the first letter confirmed they want Scotland to be no more than a region. Lord George Fawkes argues that there must be appropriate consequences if Scottish ministers were shown to have spent money in areas reserved to Westminster. Why we must rein in SNP abuse of taxpayers' money, Herald Scotland, February 21. In particular, he is concerned spending on what he describes as embassies, the nine offices in Europe and North America, paid for from the Scottish Government's International and European Relations budget of €35 million in the coming financial year. As a benchmark, the €35 million expenditure complained of is a tiny part of the Scottish Government budget of £59,706 in the coming financial year. Given its minuscule size to the point of disappearing, we might ask why Lord Fawkes and his two supporters, Baroness Goldie and Lord Wallace, are so exercised by this spending, which in terms of quantum is utterly insignificant. Such matters as economic development, the environment, planning, sport and the arts and tourism appear in the list of devolved matters. All of them have an international dimension, extending beyond trade, an issue which particularly seems to irk Lord Fawkes and currently dealt with by Scottish Council Development and Industry Offices, international trade being a matter retained at Westminster in any case. There does therefore seem to be a case for arguing that Scottish Government spending is lawful. However, here Lord Fawkes makes clear just what his aim is when he writes that if spending on overseas offices and other matters were deemed to be within Holyrood's powers, the legal loopholes must be tightened. So, there we have the truth. If Scottish Government spending is beyond its powers, then it can be stopped. But if it does have the necessary powers, then these must be tightened. Heads, Westminster wins. Tails, it still wins. Does this not point clearly to the fear of a unionist cabal to keep the Scottish government a secret and the Scottish polity a carefully guarded secret? Internationally, their aim seems to be for Scottish politicians and the Scottish parliament and government to operate first of the UK only ever as a region of the UK. Alistair Galloway, Dumbarton. FM knows no shame. Interviewed on STV's Scotland Tonight, February 20, Humza Yousaf set out to stall for the coming general election, and it was quite a performance. Here was the political equivalent of an actor determined to stick to his script never tempted into facing up to reality and the part he and his party have played in it. He wants us to blame Westminster for everything that has gone wrong. After 17 years of the SNP in power, he pretends the inept government that he leads has done a good job in all the critical public services that we see struggling to deliver the basics that we all so depend upon. For our First Minister, Political spin has become his language of choice, 
so he can blatantly claim he has increased funding for local authorities when Kozla and everyone else knows the opposite is the case. Then, as a crowning insult to the people of Scotland, he repeats the cynical slate of hand, whereby a slight majority of taxpayers paying a near meaningless £20 less tax a year allows him to falsely claim we are paying less tax than in the rest of the UK, despite everyone earning 28000 and over having to pay significantly more tax for the at times shocking outcomes he and his party have presided over. As our continuity First Minister, Mr Yousaf has sought to outdo, outdo what went before, giving doctors a pay rise before knowing how he would pay for it and then announcing a freeze on council tax in full knowledge that he would not be able to afford to properly recompense local authorities for the shortfall in their funding. He claims the halting of NHS Scotland's key capital projects and the slashing of locally provided services are not linked to his actions, but rather the fault of the big bad wolf down south. This political performance we are all having to endure swings wildly from farce to pantomime, with a lead actor who simply knows no shame. Keith Harrell, West Linton I noticed that in your politics page, Humsa Yousaf has paid fulsome tribute to Michael Matheson. FM's warm tribute to ex-health secretary ahead of iPad Probe's publication, the Herald, February 21. Was your writer hinting at the oft-forgotten meaning, insincere? Mark Bratchpiece, Motherwell. This is from the Herald Scotland on Monday the 26th of February 2024. From Voices section. Net zero challenges for businesses with commercial premises. Article by Colin Borland. If you're running a small business, it's likely that most of your priorities are in the short term, very short term, immediate term and should have been done yesterday term categories. Sales need to be made, wages need to be paid, invoices need chased, regulations complied with. Little wonder then that someone trying to flag up a change that's coming in 20 years might struggle to get your attention. But I'll try anyway. Under the 2019 Climate Change Emissions Reductions Targets Act, the one that requires Scotland to reach net zero by 2045, we need to achieve a 75% reduction in emissions by 2030. This moves to a 90% reduction by 2040. The Scottish Government states that the third largest cause of our greenhouse gas emissions is the way we heat our homes, workplaces and other buildings. So, to meet their legal obligations, ministers propose to introduce legislation which will require all homeowners and, crucially, businesses to make their main heating system zero emissions by 2045. Not only that, if you purchase a home or business premises, you will be obliged to replace any old fossil fuel heating system within a fixed period. It's difficult to put into words how huge a challenge this is. For example... The Scottish Government's Heat Networks Delivery Plan states that the aim is to supply 3% of current heat demand from heat networks by 2027, rising to 8% by 2030. Last August, however, Consumer Scotland stated that around 1.5% of Scotland's heat is supplied from heat networks, describing the 8% by 2030 target as ambitious, and requiring around 650,000 additional homes to be switched over. Further, last year, almost two-thirds of small firms told our big small business survey that they had a limited or no understanding of how their business will be impacted by the shift to net zero. Three-fifths said there wasn't enough support available to cushion the impact of their transition to net zero on their business. So, there's quite a way to travel, and lots of questions about how we actually get there. Not least, how are we paying for all this? 
I scarcely need to point out that small businesses are not exactly awash with spare cash at the moment, and FSB figures from last year showed that more than 80% of Scotland's small businesses had not engaged with government net zero support initiatives. Thus, the financial support on offer needs to be clear and practical before any more obligations are enshrined in law. It's clear that there will also need to be exemptions or extensions for those who can't practically meet the new standards. This might extend to certain types of premises that are particularly difficult to modify due to particular characteristics or the owner's own circumstances. However, businesses will need to know exactly what these exemptions mean and how they'll work before making any financial commitments. But of course, it's not all about costs. There are also, if we do it correctly, significant business opportunities in all this work. The question, though, is whether the supply chain is ready. How do we ensure the availability of the proposed clean heating systems, such as heat pumps, modern efficient storage heaters and heat networks? Will small businesses be encouraged to design, build and supply the components for use in Scotland? How can these massive programmes be designed so that they can be delivered by smaller local firms, not just huge multinational contractors? Also, how do we link up schemes to get domestic properties up to the new standards with those looking at commercial premises? If, say, tenement flats in a town centre are being upgraded, how do we make sure the shop units at street level are also retrofitted at the same time? All these points and more will need to be addressed in the forthcoming Heat in Buildings Bill, on which the Scottish Government is currently seeking views. I don't imagine that the consultation section of the Scottish Government's website is your most visited internet bookmark. But if you do any business from a commercial premises, it's worth having a look before the consultation closes a week on Friday. It might not be a now problem, but it's coming over the horizon and we can't ignore it. Colin Borland is Director of Devolved Nations for the Federation of Small Businesses. This is from the Herald Scotland on Monday the 26th of February 2024. From Voices section. Police Scotland. The growing problem of what crime is. Article by Mark Smith. Feature writer. There was a bit of a stooshy this week over reports the police in Scotland will no longer investigate every reported crime. The Tories called it dangerous. Labour said trust in the service would be damaged. And the Police Federation said the public was being badly let down. Not a good day for police PR. On the face of it, the criticism is understandable. Someone breaks into your shed and steals your tools. Your bike's nicked from outside the co-op. Your jacket goes missing from the pub. And when you report it to the police, they say, Sorry sir, madam, other. We will not be investigating this offence. Have a nice life. You're sincerely Police Scotland. Of course, It wouldn't be said in those exact words. The official jargon is the crime has been directly filed. But the consequences are the same. The offence is recorded in the system, and that's the end. No further investigation. A decision to directly file in this way would only be taken, say the police, if there was no reasonable lead. But what are we really talking about here? Some of the critics seem to be suggesting Police Scotland will now be routinely turning a blind eye to all minor crimes. But that's not quite true. Every reported offence, no matter how minor, will be assessed. But a decision will then be made about what the proportionate response should be. If there's no clear lead to follow up, it'll be dropped. That's going to be frustrating, obviously for the guy who's had his bike nicked from outside the co-op, and anyone else in similar circumstances. But it's important to check how we feel about such cases, 
and what the police and the courts should be doing about relatively minor offences. We also need to look at why the police might be making this decision now, and more broadly, whether they're getting their approach to crime right. The police say they took the decision after a successful pilot in Aberdeen, but there's more to it than that, some of it troubling. First, the police approach to minor offences. It's reasonable for the Tories to ask which crimes will be affected by the extension of the pilot, and how the police will make their decisions. But the logical conclusion of their criticism is that the police should be investigating every minor offence with the same rigour and persistence. And that's never been the case. Decisions have always been taken about the importance of an offence and the likelihood of a successful result. And for obvious reasons, resources are finite. And always will be. Worrying about certain minor offences not being pursued is also looking at the problems with the justice system the wrong way round. Speak to anyone who works in a prison and they'll tell you that we're still sending too many people to jail for relatively trivial offences. In other words, one of the big problems with justice isn't that we're failing to pursue minor offences. It's that we're pursuing them way beyond the point where it's reasonable to do so. None of that disguises the real reason the police have made the decision they have. Labour says the SNP should give the police the resources they need to keep neighbourhoods safe, but given we'll never be safe from the risk of some crime, that sounds like a recipe for infinitely increasing funds. Having said that, the recent decision to change, reform, cut police and justice services, including this most recent one about not investigating certain crimes, have clearly been taken because the Scottish Government isn't providing the police with the funding they need. You can see the consequences of that failure all over the place. Last year, for example, I spoke to several police officers who told me what was happening at Glasgow's CCTV Operations Centre in London Road. Basically, the place is now no longer monitored between 3am and 3pm, restricting a service the police rely on. And it's because of budget pressures. The same applies to the recent decision to restrict police attendance at mental health-related incidents. It's taking up resources that are badly stretched. And the Chief Constable, Joe Farrell, said the police must now focus only on their core duties. But let's look at what the core duties apparently are, because there's some confusion, including in the police and in government. And that's a problem for a service struggling to cope. The Scottish Government Act that set up Police Scotland in 2012 says the main purpose of policing is to improve the safety and well-being of persons, localities and communities. But is that right? Why no mention of crime? Shouldn't that be priority number one? Perhaps then the well-being of persons, whatever that might be, would be taken care of. The really woolly focus on well-being, which comes directly from the top, may also help explain why a force that's having to make cuts is actually expanding in another area that has the potential to suck up precious resources. You may have noticed over the weekend that Police Scotland were posting on X about hate crime. Hate has no place in Scotland, they said. There was also a link to a Crime Stoppers website that defines hate crime. A lot of time and money is being spent in this area, ahead of the launch of a new specialist unit to enforce the SNP's Hate Crime and Public Order Act. The concern many of us have is that the perfectly reasonable and proportionate approach the police are now going to take to some minor crimes will not be applied in the same way to hate crimes. The definition the police were pointing us to at the weekend is shockingly vague and misguided. A hate crime, it says, is any crime which is perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated by malice or ill will towards a social group. In other words, one of the ancient cornerstones of Scots law 
that the intention of the perpetrator is crucial has been scrapped, ditched, chucked out the window. What this logically means, if this is the definition the police will apply, is that officers will have to accept complainants at face value whenever they say they've been a victim of a hate crime, and the potential consequences of that are obvious. Certain people and certain opinions being classed as hateful for potentially trivial or vexatious reasons. It's been called the weaponization of hate crime, and it has the potential to be a big and growing problem for Police Scotland. The answer, and there's still time to do this, would be to apply the test of proportionality and the reasonableness which Police Scotland say they're going to apply to certain minor crimes, to hate crimes too. Hate crimes are a real thing. Of course they are. But so is the phenomenon of perfectly reasonable opinions being labelled as hate crimes. And so the police should be considering in every case whether it is serious and whether it should be investigated or followed up. They should also absolutely be considering the intention of the person who made the comment. This is all good legal common sense, I would have thought, but it especially makes sense in a landscape where the police are struggling to fund their work and are being forced to make cuts. They need to spend wisely and they need to prioritise their resources and that must mean, in the never-ending story of austerity, shifting their focus from certain areas, minor crimes that are never likely to be solved, and personal opinions that should never be considered a crime in the first place. That article was by Mark Smith. This is from the Herald Scotland, on Monday the 26th of February 2024, from Voices Section. Praise for tenacious and clever small businesses. Article by Dominic Ryan. The UK's leading membership organisation for small businesses and the self-employed has praised the fighting spirit of companies throughout Scotland. Colin Borland, director of Devolved Nations at the Federation of Small Businesses, FSB, also spoke about the importance of being part of a supportive community in order to succeed in today's harsh economic environment. Speaking on the Go Radio Business Show with Hunter and Hoy, Mr Borland said, Scotland's small businesses have responded to the current challenges. They've been tenacious. They've been really clever and have adapted. As of March 2023, there was a total of 338,385 small and medium-sized enterprises operating in Scotland, providing an estimated 1.2 million jobs. The FSB, meantime, has a current membership of 15,000 in Scotland, with the primary goal of helping companies achieve their ambitions. My message here is, if you're a small family business, there is a huge umbrella group in the FSB that you can be part of. It's got your back. It's also a genuine community, said Mr Borland. For example, we do a lot of trade shows, exhibitions and expos, and we get the brand out there. I get lots of people coming up and saying, I'm an FSB member, and telling me what we've done for them, the people they've met through FSB, or the vital business connections they've gained through us. Reflecting on today's economic climate, Mr Borland noted its similarities to the pressurised environment experienced in 1974, the year the FSB was founded, adding, Back then, the corporates were represented in government by the shape of the CBI, You also had the trade union movement representing the workers. Those in the middle, who were self-employed or running their own business, had no one standing up for them, amid obstacles such as extra taxes for self-employment. So they got together and said, no, we need to do something about this. We need to even up the score a wee bit. That's why we were formed, and we've just grown and grown. Mr Borland pointed out that fundamental to the FSB's mission was its work in ensuring top-tier legislators listened to small businesses and fully took on board their needs. 
A lot of what we do is behind the scenes, talking about the details, about things that are coming in terms of legislation. We understand the many and varied calls that are on the people who are decision makers, but we do get a fair hearing. There are politicians and officials and key decision makers who absolutely get it, who do understand it. Mr Borland noted, above all, becoming involved in a small business or being self-employed may bring challenges, but also offers great rewards. After the 2008-2009 recession, 9 out of 10 people who moved from economic inactivity back into the labour market did so by either going to work in a small business or setting one up themselves. This demonstrates, in terms of social mobility, self-employment or starting a business is a great way to actually climb that ladder. If you're feeling stuck or if you're getting hemmed in by a corporate or a more formal structure, you can get out there and do your own thing and move yourself up. Right now, he said, businesses were sharing with him reports of experiencing a flat year-on-year turnover, while costs have gone up by 10%. We asked our members recently, which year has been the toughest? Because it's been a bit of a roller coaster since 2020. Obviously, 2021 came out top. However, last year ran a pretty close second. All the support around COVID, which was absolutely marvellous and welcome, disappeared. Moreover, the cost of doing business really has hit people, particularly in the industries such as retail, leisure and hospitality, which are vulnerable to discretionary consumer spend. But Scottish businesses have taken it on the chin, said Mr Borland. They're not going to give up without a fight. That article was by Dominic Ryan. The Herald on the 23rd of February and the sports section. Europa League draw, when is it and who can Rangers get? By Ewan Payton. As Philippe Clement has proudly stated, Rangers are the only remaining Scottish club to be participating in three competitions as we enter the business end of the season. The Ibrox Club are top of the Premiership after a dramatic weekend of action involving Celting dropping more domestic points on home soil to Kilmarnock. Rangers took full advantage by defeating St Johnson 3-0 in Perth to put themselves into pole position for the title. They have more fixtures than Brendan Rodgers' men to contend with, though, as the season run-in approaches. That's because Rangers are very much still involved in the Europa League. They qualified out of their group as winners after a tremendous away victory against Real Betis in December. So Rangers will be a seeded team for the next round of the competition. Add the Scottish Cup into the mix and Rangers have plenty to play for in the months ahead. Here is everything that you need to know about the draw for the last 16 of the Europa League. The draw for the Europa League last 16 will take place today, Friday, February 23. It will take place at 11am. The draw will be made at UEFA's headquarters in Nyon, Switzerland. The draw will be shown live on television. TNT Sports holds the exclusive rights to showcase European club action. They will broadcast the draw live on TNT Sports 1. Who is in the hat for Europa League last 16 draw? Uh, seeded are Liverpool, West Ham, Brighton, Atlanta, Bayern, Leverkusen, Rangers, Villarreal, Slavia, Prague. And unseeded are Roma, Sparta, Prague, Marseille, Sporting, Lisbon, Benfica, Freiburg, AC, Milan and Kravabag. The last 16 ties will be played on March 17 and March 14, with the former representing the first leg date. All ties take place over two legs, with the group members, including Rangers, at home in the second legs. And that was by Ewan Payton. The Herald on the 23rd of February and the sports section. Rangers and Celtic dealt major championship league spot blow by Ewan Payton. Scotland's automatic path into the Champions League looks set to be coming to an end. 
Last night's set of results in favour of teams from the Czech Republic dealt a major blow to both Premiership title chasers Rangers and Celtic. As is well known, by finishing top spot in Scotland, not only is the crown secured, but so is a place in the group stage of the following season's Champions League and the £40 million riches that brings. Over the past two years, the winners Celtic have entered the competition without the need to go through the strenuous qualification process, while Rangers in second have had to negotiate some ties in order to progress. The Ibrox club managed that feat under Giovanni von Bronckhurst, but failed under Michael Beale. On both occasions, they faced PSV Eindhoven. Now it looks increasingly likely that this season will be the last for a while that a Scottish team automatically qualifies for the Champions League by winning the Premiership. That's because Scotland's place in the 10th of UEFA's coefficient table hangs in the balance, and unfortunately looks like it will be wiped out by the Czechs, which would see Scotland drop outside of the top 10 into 11th. Scotland has a tiny lead over the Czech Republic, now with 35.85 points, while last night's dramatic win for Sparta Prague saw the nation's coefficient score reach 35.3 points. It was a terrible result for Scotland's coefficient, with 0.75 points added to their overall total. Sparta scored an incredible three goals inside the last 15 minutes to beat Galatasaray 6-4 on aggregate. Czechs hold a distinct advantage over Scotland in this situation because they have three teams remaining in European competition, while the Scots are solely reliant on Rangers to fly the flag. So, even if Rangers does progress to the quarters, it would be more beneficial for Scotland if all three Czech teams were to be eliminated in the next round. Joining Sparta in the Europa League last 16 is city rivals Slavia, who, like Rangers, qualified via the group stage. Victoria Pleasant topped their Europa Conference League group before Christmas to progress. While it's definitely a concern for the future, the winners of this season's top flight in Scotland will still enjoy their participation in the revamped Champions League next term, with that much unaffected. However, any potential changes would come into play in the following campaign, which is the 2025-26 season. And that was by Ewan Payton. From the Herald Scotland... Monday the 26th of February, from the news section. Ethiopia appeal launched as millions of children face starvation. Report by journalist Gabriel Mackay. An emergency appeal has been launched with millions of children on the brink of starvation in Ethiopia. The impact of the Tigray war has left millions of people in the East African country facing emergency levels of food insecurity and hunger. The Ethiopian government has projected that 15.8 million people would require food assistance in 2024, including 4 million internally displaced people and 7.2 million needing emergency help. International school feeding charity Mary's Meals has been working in Ethiopia since 2017 and feeds 24,320 children every school day. With its local partner, it provides daily school meals to marginalised and disadvantaged children in the impoverished Tigray region in the northeast of the country, close to the Eritrean border. During the civil war, Mary's Meals provided community feeding programmes to 30,000 people while schools were closed and families were displaced. The emergency appeal will look, look to ensure that children in Tigray have food and try and get them back into education, with over 7 million believed to be out of school due to the conflict. Matt Barlow, Executive Director of Mary's Meals, said, the stories we are hearing from our partner in Ethiopia are simply devastating. The two-year civil war has caused widespread destruction and left physical and mental scars on people all over the Tigray, including children, many of whom have missed years of schooling and who are now starving. The war has undone years of progress in Tigray's education system and we know the impact of children missing years of learning is huge. With your support, we can bring these hungry children back to the classroom and give them a nutritious meal which will allow them to focus on their lessons and give them an education. Ultimately, this will help to lift them, their families and communities out of the extreme poverty they are living in. The situation is urgent, but there is something you can do. You can help to bring these desperate children back from the brink of starvation. 
Throughout the UK, I have witnessed people respond with incredible acts of kindness in moments of crisis and when all hope may seem lost. Now we need your support. Please donate what you can today. Even the smallest donation can help us to save a life. To find out more about Mary's Meals Crisis in Ethiopia Appeal, go online. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 26th of February, from the news section, Johnny McKnight gives Cameron Lecture in full dame costume. Report by Jodie Harrison. Stage star and panto legend Johnny McKnight was dame for a laugh as he celebrated the magic of Scottish theatre. The performer, director and educator delivered to Cameron Lecture at a Park University of Glasgow's Butte Hall, dressed in flamboyant fashion as one of his favourite pantomime characters. The Cameron Lecture turns the spotlight on Scotland's great theatre traditions and the life and work of one of its champions. It was delivered through a partnership between the University of Glasgow and the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. It was established in 2019 by John Tiffany, the multi-award winning theatre director and University of Glasgow alumnus, to honour his life-changing tutor, Dr Alistair Cameron. Johnny, a Royal Conservatoire of Scotland alumnus, delivered the 2024 lecture titled The Panto Dame, She's Behind You, on Sunday, dressed in full regalia and channeling the character Dorothy Buona Gale. Johnny said, I am in love with the magic of theatre and, as you would expect me to say, I adore being, adore being in pantomime. It is a great honour to help remember the contribution of Scottish theatre personality Alistair Cameron and to also celebrate Scotland's much-loved pantomime genre. I feel very honoured to give the Cameron lecture in 2024 and hope, for one day only, to bring a bit of magic and character of the panto to the Butte Hall in the University of Glasgow. The event was also a celebration of the art of theatre, with pantomime costumes on display from the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. The collection featured a pantomime dress, dame dress worn by legendary Scottish variety entertainer Jimmy Logan OBE, in his guise as Lizzie Trotter in the 1987 production of Jack and the Beanstalk. The dress forms part of Jimmy Logan's extensive archive, bequeathed to the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland's archive and collections by Jimmy's estate in 2001. Five costume students, Isabel Crone, Maureen Goodall, Olivia Hartshorn, Charlotte McGowan and Ines Lucia Quinn Callan, who are studying in the BA Production Arts and Design degree programme at RCS, also showcased a flamboyant collection of panto costumes. Also on display from the Ambassador Theatre Group was a silver dress worn by one of Scotland's finest panto dames, Stanley Baxter, as Widow Twanky in the 1986 production of Aladdin at the Kings, Kings Theatre Glasgow. It was joined by a head, headdress and wig designed by Terry Parsons and worn by Stanley in the 1983 production of Mother Goose. Dr Alistair Cameron was the University of Glasgow's renowned a much admired senior lecturer in the Department of Theatre Studies. The lecture series, created along with Dr Cameron's brother Robin and great friend Roberta Doyle, showcases the special qualities of Scotland's dynamic and provocative theatre and performance creators, the unique heritage of the performing arts in Scotland and the important impact they continue to have across the globe. A core philosophy of the Cameron Lecture is access and inclusivity. Public tickets for a fee event were snapped up within a matter of minutes. An allocation was also reserved to enable students and staff from both institutions to attend. John Tiffany, whose credits include Harry Potter and the Cursed Child in London's West End and Worldwide, and the National Theatre of Scotland's seminal Black Watch, said, Alistair was a hugely inspiring and inspirational teacher who was wonderfully kind. Following his premature death at just 41, it felt fitting to create a lecture series that celebrates and highlights his love of Scottish theatre and its practitioners. It is so strange to realise that the second lecture has been held in the 30th anniversary year of Alistair's untimely death. I'm so thrilled that the exceptionally talented Johnny McKnight has agreed to give this year's Cameron lecture. Alistair's legacy is extraordinary, not just for us, his students and colleagues, but as a superb champion of Scottish theatre. I am delighted that Alistair's remarkable legacy has now been shared with a wider audience through these lectures and held at the University of Glasgow, which he loved dearly. 
Another former student of Dr Cameron, Professor Deirdre Hedden, the James Arnott Chair in Drama and Theatre Studies at the University of College and Arts and Humanities, introduced Johnny McKnight's Cameron Lecture in 2024 to a packed audience at the University's Butte Hall. The first Cameron Lecture, in December 2019, was delivered by Royal Conservatoire of Scotland alumnus Alan Cumming, the multi-award winning Hollywood, Broadway and TV star and author and activist. John and Alan collaborated on productions of The Bucky and Macbeth for the National Theatre of Scotland. In the inaugural lecture, Alan charted his journey from growing up in Perthia to studying at RCS and a career that has taken him from stage to screen, from smash Broadway musicals to blockbusting movies and water cooler TV shows. And that article was by Jodie Harrison. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 26th of February, from the news section, Man shot in Stirling as eyewitnesses urged to come forward. Article by Gabriel Mackay. A man was shot on his doorstep in Stirling in an apparent targeted attack as police appealed to the public for information. A 38-year-old man in the winds of Milton area of the city was assaulted with a firearm at a property in Randolph Crescent. The man was taken to Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow where he was treated for a minor injury and then discharged. Police believe he was deliberately targeted. Detective Inspector John Curry of Stirling Police Office said, Since this incident was reported, we have been carrying out extensive inquiries in and around the local area along with gathering and studying a large amount of CCTV footage. We believe this was a targeted attack and are following a number of lines of inquiry. We would appreciate any assistance the public can give us in identifying who is responsible for this reckless and dangerous act. If you were in the area of Randolph Crescent around 8pm on Monday, 19th of February, or have information that could assist our investigation, please contact us. A silver or grey Kia Sportage was seen in Randolph Crescent and Glasgow Road around the time of the shooting. We would urge anyone with information on this car or anyone with dashcam or personal footage to review it and get in touch if you hold any detail on this. A Kia Sportage matched in the description of the one seen in Randolph Crescent was found burnt out near the A71, Air Road, Shots, around 11.10pm that same evening. It is currently undergoing forensic examination and again, I'd ask if you have any information regarding this to, to please come forward. Additional policing patrols remain in the area to provide public reassurance while we investigate this crime. Anyone with information, no matter how insignificant it may seem, should contact 101, quoting incident number 3511 of 19th of February. Alternatively, Crime Stoppers can be contacted on 0800 555 111, where anonymity can be maintained. And that report was by journalist Gabriel Mackay. From the Herald, Monday 26th of February 2024. Sports section. Goal scoring keeper on lookout for new club after short championship stint. By Ewan Payton, sports writer. He became an internet sensation with one kick of a ball. That's because it's not every day you see a goalkeeper scoring, nor playing as an outfield player. Alistair Adams scored a thunderous half volley from 30 yards a little over two months ago for our broth, as he was the unlikely hero in helping the championship strugglers secure a point at Wraith Rovers. Now the 32-year-old is on the lookout for a new club after it appears he's been let go by Jim McIntyre's side. He took to social media to confirm the news last night. He wrote, play five, won three, drew two, lost nil. Clean record, one goal and a few unforgettable moments. Don't know what's next, but what I do know is I'm hungry and ready to work. Anyone want a goalie? Let's go. It's some record for a substitute goalkeeper whose tremendous goal went viral on various social media sites after the game on December the 30th. The humble backup cemented himself as Red Litchie's cult hero with the incredible strike, with the game finishing 2-2 at Starks Park. With all three outfield subs already on the pitch, McIntyre had no choice but to send Adams on, up top when Aaron Steele pulled out injured. 
The towering goalkeeper made his presence known as he ruffled more than a few feathers in the Rovers' back line. He unleashed an unstoppable strike from distance to give Kevin Dabrowski no chance. After his stunning strike, he said at the time, All the boys have come together. It's not just about me. We've got a thin squad and hopefully that will be rectified over the next few weeks. But all the boys have dug in since the new gaffer took over. He asked me if I was willing to go on. I said, of course, I'll go and help the team. When I'm a Don, everyone in the stadium thought it was a joke, but one person didn't. I'm confident in my abilities and I know I can play a bit. But obviously, I didn't expect that. I just thought, I'll have a go, and it was just instinctive. It was one of those situations where nobody's expecting anything from you. It's almost like playing football at the five asides with your mates. I said to the gaffer as well, I'm just going to go on. I'm not going to stand about and make myself look stupid. That article was by Ewan Payton. From the Herald, Saturday, 24th of February, 2024. Sports section. Scotland 30, England 21. Van der Meer scores stunning hat-trick in Calcutta Cup win. By Anthony Brown. Magnificent Duhan van der Meer became the first player to score a Calcutta Cup hat-trick for Scotland as they soared to their fourth consecutive victory over England in an intoxicating Guinness Six Nations showdown in Edinburgh. The jet heeled wing, who scored a stunning double at Twickenham just over 12 months ago, had the home crowd in raptures as he produced the Murrayfield Masterclass to inspire his team to a 30-21 victory and move to within one of Scotland's all-time career record tri-scorers, Stuart Hogg. England started brightly and opened up an early 10-0 lead with George Fairbank scoring his first international try. But Steve Bothwick's team offered little thereafter as their unbeaten start to the championship shuddered to a halt. Remarkably, the Red Rose have now won only one of their last seven meetings with Scotland. Led into battle by courageous captain Jamie George just over a week after he lost his mother to cancer, England made a strong start. Having forced the Scots back from the outset, the Red Rose got themselves ahead in the fifth minute when Northampton fullback Furbank, making his first start in almost two years, bounded over gleefully from close range after being played in by Elliot Daly at the end of a brilliant move. Scotland suffered a further setback moments later when Xander Fagerson had to go off for an HIA, although the influential prop was able to return to the fray in the 18th minute. By that point, England had opened up a 10-0 lead, with Ford kicking a penalty in the 15th minute. Scotland had been in a state of disarray for most of the opening quarter, but they suddenly sparked into life and got themselves back into the game in the 20th minute. Hugh Jones made a dash for the line on the right after being dragged to the ground. The centre flipped the ball up into the path of Van der Meer, who produced a superb piece of skill to find a a gap and bolt over. The early wind had been removed from England's sails and Van der Meer edged the Scots in front on the half-hour mark with a breathtaking score from his own half. As the visitors mounted an attack, Ford's heavy pass bounced off the face of Furbank and into the hands of Jones, who instantly offloaded the Van der Meer 60 metres out. The wing put on the afterburners and raced clear up the left, leaving a trail of white jerseys in his slipstream. Finn Russell added the extras before stretching the host advantage to 17-10, with a penalty shortly afterwards. England were wobbling, but Ford kept his coup to reduce their interval deficit to four points with an opportunistic drop goal from 35 yards out. Scotland suffered what appeared to be a blow within seconds of the second half kicking off when Sion to Pulitu limped off to be replaced by Cam Redpath. However, the substitute centre was instrumental in the host going further ahead in the 45th minute when he burst through a gap on the halfway line. A rock ensued as Redpath was halted in his tracks and Russell produced one of his trademark cross-field kicks out to the left for Van der Meer, who burst over for his hat-trick and his 26th try for Scotland. Ford reduced the deficit to 24-16 with a penalty in the 50th minute, but Russell put the home side firmly back in command with a couple of penalties either side of the R mark. England, having offered little since the opening quarter, gave themselves a glimmer of hope in the 67th minute, when replacement wing Emmanuel Faye Waboso 
bolted over on the left. Finn Smith, with the chance to bring his side within a converted try of victory, hit the post with a conversion, leaving the Scots nine points ahead and able to see out the remainder of the match in relatively comfortable fashion. Not even a yellow card in the closing moments for a tip tackle could take the shine of Van der Meer's day. That article was by Anthony Brown. This article is from the Herald on the 20th of February 2024 from the sports section. The headline reads, Dark times as municipal golf courses face the cut. The report is by Nick Roger. If you've ever worked from home, you'll know that there are occasions when it can be as mentally nourishing as a baby's rattle. I mean, that sentence that you've just read there was the laboured, unimaginative product of about two hours spent gazing forlornly at the blank screen of my laptop during a prolonged period of crippling inactivity. There are probably prison inmates who get more creative inspiration ticking off the days of their sentence with a shard of chalk on their cell wall than I do sitting hunched at my desk in the sitting room. In fact, my latest bout of inertia was so stifling, I half expected the actual laptop to break the weary silence and suddenly say, can you please do something, as this is getting dreadfully awkward. It was like being on a bad date. As you can see, though, we got there in the end, and another back page column which is supposed to inform and entertain the nation, but instead inflicts itself on the populace like a particularly violent strain of norovirus, awaits your consumption. Or perhaps your condemnation? What awaits the good folk of Holland Bush Golf Club, meanwhile, is a decision on the future of their cherished facility. South Lanarkshire's council budget meeting is scheduled for tomorrow and the course in Les Mahego has been earmarked for closure along with a whole host of village halls, libraries and community centres in and around the parish. The savings the council needs to make runs into the kind of millions that the Saudi Public Investment Fund, PIF, dishes out at a LIV golf prize-giving ceremony. When it comes to fixing potholes, meanwhile, you could say most councils are taking, well, the PIF. But I digress. By all accounts, Hollenbush, one of six clubs operated by South Lanarkshire Leisure and Culture, has a robust, loyal and passionate membership. According to those involved with the popular municipal just off the M74, the course has never looked better, never been busier, and the clubhouse is thriving. A recent post on the club's social media page called for the local community to bombard councillors in a rousing, rallying cry that could have featured a bugle call and fixed bayonets while a public consultation has generated considerable support for the retention of the facility ahead of the big meeting. Whether this call to arms has the desired effect remains to be seen. Filling vast financial black holes tends to be a ruthless old business. There will be plenty of folk out there who would probably sooner see a golf course sacrificed rather than, say, a library or a swimming pool. People have their own leisure preferences, after all. In this dire state, something, or indeed a few things, will have to give. Community hubs, whether for golfing, reading, duking or simply blithering, suffer as a result. Not that long ago, when the devastation of Covid kicked in, the shadow of closure loomed large over Holland Bush, as it did with many clubs and courses throughout the Graham's cradle. 
When, however, golf became the pastime of the pandemic and enjoyed an unexpected but hugely welcome surge in popularity, it was given a new lease of life. Amid the clouds of COVID, there was a silver lining. Golf provided a welcome sanctuary during that wretched spell. It was a soothing retreat for body and mind. At a time when bodies and minds continued to be ravaged by rises in obesity, dependency and depression, the threat to any leisure facility, not just golfing ones, is always sorely felt. We all know that some municipal courses have had a trying time in recent years. Once valued resources have withered on the vine and many affordable, accessible routes into the game that Scotland gave to the world have been locked up, fenced off and choked by the weeds of neglect. The R&A bought Letham Hill, the old council course on the south bank of Hoganfield Loch, and transformed it into a pioneering, multi-million pound, come-you-all family facility. But the r and can't buy every municipal course that's struggling. Now, there's an idea, eh? Over in the east, there's talk that Caird Park in Dundee, once the busiest municipal in Europe, and the place where Sandy Lyle's Uncle Walter was a pro back in the 1950s, could be set for the chop. Down in the south of the UK, I was reading that councillors had been asked if a nine-hole track in the seaside town of Torquay is the most appropriate use of space after a series of wayward clatters and batters damaged the roof of the Grade 1 listed Spanish barn which sits in front of the course. Funnily enough, I often curse and mut- mutter to myself during a round of pitiful ineptitude that I couldn't hit the barn, let alone the barn door, with my driver. I wonder if I'd have more luck hitting the blooming barn roof with one of my woeful hoiks and hoaks. If the Torquay councillors get the way, I may not get the chance. What are the chances, meanwhile, of South Lanarkshire Council sparing Hollenbush? Well, all eyes will be on tomorrow's budget meeting and what decisions emerge from it. In competitive golf, everybody wants to make the cut. For all those who hold Holland Bush dear, though, this is one cut they hope to miss. That report was by Nick Roger. The Herald on the 27th of February and the Arts and Ends section. BBC Scotland needs to show programming imagination by Kevin McKenna. At the end of my interview with Stuart Cosgrove yesterday, I, he said this, I'll probably get effing sacked from off the ball now. The prospect of him being removed from the longest running football show on UK radio for some reasonably expressed criticism about BBC Scotland is a remote one. And there was a twinkle in his voice as he expressed his fear. And besides, the longevity of Off the Ball is because it doesn't treat its core audience with the condescension and contempt it gets from Scotland's state political and medium Duma. In Scotland, the nation's privileged and state-funded broadcaster gets a bit prickly when anyone seeks to criticise it. In 2022, I was effectively cancelled from a forthcoming appearance in seven days, for having offered some mild criticism of the BBC's absurdly over-the-top coverage of the late Queen Elizabeth's funeral. My colleagues can't be expected to overlook your criticism of them, I was told. Prior to this, the weekly media show which Mr Crosgrove presented on Eamon O'Neill was abruptly axed by Boxes Pacific Key, despite it being un- universally acclaimed for its authoritative and grown-up approach to analysing the previous week's major news stories. The show aired each Thursday around lunchtime and was everything you'd expect from Scotland's national broadcaster. It sought to explain the reasons why various media outlets covered these stories in the way that they did. It provided intense and detailed analysis of ongoing international stories, and it didn't spare the print and broadcast media trench on criticism if they felt it necessary. 
This occasionally included BBC Scotland. I've since been told by a well-placed source from within the Pacific Key that one or two senior executives were furious at such criticism and had been targeting this show for a while. It was never adequately replaced and now exists as a weekly podcast with guests, which easily outstrips any of what passes for BBC Scotland's political coverage. My interview with Mr Cosgrove occurred at the same week that the BBC Scotland announced it was axing three programmes which were expected to form the political and cultural backbone of the new Scotland channel when it was launched five years ago. Very few people could have been surprised when time was finally called on the nine, seven days and the edit. The viewing figures alone were so low that you ought to have considered inviting in the studio as means of significantly increasing them. Pleasingly, the much higher quality debate night has survived and thrived. It's not that the presenters lack talent, just that the format seemed to reflect a troubling air of condescension by the supercilious broadcast media elites about the attention span of the punters. Let's break the big, complicated stories into bite-sized portions and make like the cast of Friends in Central Perk. BBC Scotland's head of news and current affairs was brought in to paint some lipstick on the situation. In any other business, he'd be getting these jotters for such a prolonged and manifest failure on his watch. BBC Scotland, though, is a swollen and unaccountable organisation where the senior executives swarm through its massive and scandalously underutilised aircraft hangar headquarters, knowing they never have to face any consequences, such as the gilded life of a senior public servant in Scotland. And as Mr Cosgrove pointed out in their interview, the timing of the nine did it few favours with the dynamics of mid-late evening viewing habits. He also expressed some mild astonishment that no cuts to staffing levels accompanied the announcement of the demise of these programmes. He wasn't channeling disdain for people's livelihoods, merely that all patterns of employment which have been ditched in other media organisations not supported by the taxpayer still reign in this bloated compound corporation. This effectively acted as no other bar to innovation, risk and genuine creativity. He used the public publisher slash broadcaster model, which was key to channels for success and which drives Netflix and the other streaming platforms. Even the Scottish government's recently published paper on broadcasting in an independent Scotland was glazed with caution. There was no consideration of radically altering the existing model. In Ireland, the state broadcaster RTE has both a license fee and can sell commercials. In Denmark, there isn't the equivalent of a Danish six, but rather a suite of five-minute regional bulletins that go out every hour on the hour. It speaks of a reluctance to change because, well, you don't need to change if your status funding and employment packages are guaranteed for life. As Cosgrove said, at the BBC there's always someone in the room saying you can't really do that because of X or Y, so why not just remove the X and Y? If we're talking about a new broadcasting model for a new Scotland, then perhaps we should be talking about a radical approach to commissioning. This would proceed with a significantly stripped back core staff for sport and news, with everything else being outsourced. It would encourage talent spotters to comb Scotland in its entirety, looking for fresh talent, whose ideas are not then repackaged and offered on a begging bowl at a monthly meeting in London. BBC Scotland uses millions in public money to gain a monopoly in football coverage by edging out all competition. It wouldn't matter so much if it was any good, but Radio Clyde and the other regional independents are far better with a fraction of the budget. All of its football coverage could be outsourced or co-produced. The possibilities of co-productions with independent filmmakers funded by all the regions is evident in the current three-part series, Pitch Invasion, How the Scottish and Irish Change Football. This was made by a small Northern Ireland television production company called Double Band, who received core funding from BBC Northern Ireland, BBC Scotland, and at least one other independent funding stream. This model could underpin BBC Scotland's entire drama and documentary output. The brave face which BBC Scotland contrived to produce as it zeroed its three main news and culture programmes will include a new topical current affairs series which will be published as a podcast on BBC Sounds. Really? Is that it? How many months of bashing heads together and returning tickets to London did it take to produce that one? 
The whole world is doing podcasts and it will always do them better than BBC Scotland. This has echoes of the corporation using its state-funded muscle to hire print journalists to produce regional blogs. This low-grade, anodyne, bloodless journalism, which has undercut Scotland's one vibrant local newspaper sector. Nothing in BBC Scotland's new plans suggests it won't be anodyne and bloodless either. And that was by Kevin McKenna. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.